I think I'm all set. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm so happy to see familiar faces, friends here. <laughs> uh, so as you may have realized, I changed the wineries for water. <laughs> and you may wonder why I do that, right? <laughs> like, hmm. Well, um, it turned out that uh, with the wineries work during my PhD, I was trying to understand why wine growers uh, got engaged in conservation issues. And I started thinking about collaboration because if the wineries would have collaborated to do like a biological corridor or whatever, it would have more impact. And I was thinking about those collaboration and conflict management things that uh, we see in John's class. And we were living in Valdivia in the south of Chile, and I realized that in Valdivia there were a lot of collaboration, but for urban wetlands protection. So that's why I started thinking about collaboration in urban wetlands and collective action, and I ended up with this project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, among many other things. So I have to confess that it was hard to <laughs> prepare this presentation because I want to tell you many things. And it's gonna be jumping from one topic to another probably, <laughs> but it's because I wanna tell you about my postdoc research, but also about the things that I've been doing uh, at the wetland center uh, besides the other. Uh, so this is a picture of one of the wetlands I've been studying. This is uh, neighbors and community leaders from the Angachilla wetland. And as you can see, they are like very powerful and committed to the protection of the, of of their, their wetland and they are there like cleaning up and uh, getting rid of all the invasive species that is covering up the, the mirror, the, the water mirror. So today I would like to tell you a little bit about socio-ecological transformations which is kind of the theoretical framework of my uh, postdoc project about civic ecology and social practice theories. And also why Valdivia is interesting to study transformations. Then I want to tell you a little bit about the Rio Cruces Wetland Center, where I'm working now. Then the work we did for the Ministry of Environment, in which we helped them to prepare the guidelines to implement the urban wetlands law at the national level. And then I'm coming back to transformations and the postdoc research. I hope I'll have enough time. Well, I, I don't know if you have heard about the, this concept of socio-ecological transformation, but when I started looking for literature about collaboration and collective action, I found out a lot about literature of transformation was talking about that. So in the international community, if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, they say that we have to transform the society to reach those goals, right? And in response to that, a lot of literature has uh, appeared talking about a, a large movement calling for transformations to sustainability. It's a kind of ambiguous term, but Patterson defined it as a fundamental changes in structural, functional, relational, and cognitive aspects of social, technical, ecological systems that lead to new patterns of interactions and outputs. So what the, the authors propose is that we should go beyond adapt and mitigate climate change or global environmental change, but we should be more radical and transform our society and structures. So it's kind of very ambitious, <laughs> but very interesting. And there are a lot of frameworks uh, out there that talk how, about how to analyze this transformation. And they mention different phases. For example, the first one would be triggers or pre transformation, which means that there are major social or ecological disruptions, which in turn creates windows of, of opportunity and trigger this, uh, this transformation of social ecological systems. We also have then preparing for change, navigating the transition, and finally institutionalizing the new trajectory. So the idea is to move a socio-ecological system that is going in an unsustainable pathway to change that trajectory to a sustainable one. Um, and you can go to all these phases sequentially, but also it could happen that some systems that are too uh, 
they could be facing two or more stages at the same time. So this is one framework, and I'll go back to it later. But also there is another one that says that there are three different types of transformation. So, okay, how can we do that? Uh, how can we do this? And there are three different approaches, but they are not mutually exclusive, they are complementary. And one is a structural transformation, uh, which relates to fundamental changes in the way production and consumption uh, is governed and organized. Then we have the systemic transformation that are intentional changes targeted at the interdependencies of specific institutions. And the last one, uh, which is the, the one that I'm focusing more, which is enabling transformation that focus on human agency, values, and building capacity to be more effective in, in these processes. So one thing that, that was very interesting uh, about the literature is when I found out about the still labs, uh, which are creative spaces or safe spaces facilitated uh, to design and foster this deliberate change. And I found them fascinating because you could apply all the facilitation and conflict management and all the job skills uh, in this kind of uh, labs that comes from, actually comes from social innovation labs or sustainability labs, but they target transformation. So they have emerged to provide interactive, participatory innovation spaces that allow for experimentation with new sociological, technological system configuration and sustainability pathways. So the idea is to create an innovation to think outside the box and see how can we develop multiple solutions to the challenge we face. And they, they, they aim at transcending traditional spaces for rational deliberation and participatory decision making. Uh, and this is one of the things I've been, uh, I will be working on this week with John. Yeah. So we're trying to design and implement a key lab in Valdez. So a key lab aims to uh, first frame the challenge, find innovators, and build their capacity to more effectively address the challenge, develop a change strategy that tests multiple solutions, which could help to solve the challenge and create early prototypes of interventions and build momentum for action. So these prototypes could be something technological, but they could also be a governance system or, or a new practice. So not only technological or material things. And another uh, literature that I, I ran into uh, looking for collective action was this about civic ecology that uh, was developed by Marianne Krasny in at Cornell University. And she has studied a urban socioecological system and community stewardship. So she has developed like this, I wouldn't say it's a theory, but like this movement or literature about civic ecology. But this civic ecology um, framework has been criticized for not having enough attention to social theories. So there are other studies that talked about uh, that it would be interesting to, to use social practice theory to study the civic ecology movement. And the th social theory practice uh, is very interesting because it says that the minimum unit of analysis of the social world are social practices. So it goes beyond the dichotomy agency structure or person institution, so focus on social practices itself. And there are many elements. Can I try to move this? I'm afraid. You can put it on the top. top. Okay. I think it's going to the right thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, slowly needed previous controls. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, there are many elements of the social practice theory, depends on the author, but basically, you have to look at the meanings of the practice, the materiality or the elements, the resources, 
and the random. What were the other ones? Okay. You gotta click on the <laughs> emotion. Uh, and abilities, yeah, the skills to, to do a practice. Yes. And now, why why study this in Valdivia? Why Valdivia? So, Valdivia is in Chile, which is in South America, as you can see in this long country, and it's in the south central part of the country. It's near to the coast, very close to the coast. And here in this big map, you can see then the Rio Cruces wetland, in, which goes from the San Jose de la Mariquina, which is another municipality. And here is the city of Valdivia, as you can see. So it's a huge wetland. And in 2004, there was a huge environmental disaster, which to me seems to be like a trigger or pre-transformation stage. And as you can see, there, there still is a palm mill company, Araupo, a huge forestry company, and they have a palm mill plant in the upstream of the river. And they polluted uh, the river, uh, all the algae died. And as a consequence of that, a lot of black neck swan, which is a very charismatic species, died. And it was very dramatic because they were uh, they were hungry, so they were dying of, of, yeah, they didn't have food, but they were very weak. And some people in Valdivia saw them like uh, falling from the sky in the, in the backyards. So it was really shocking for the Valdivian community. And because of that, a uh, social movement started, and it was huge. I remember I was studying biology, environmental biology in Santiago, and I could see the news, and it was very shocking to see the, the swans, like, they couldn't hold their neck. Uh, it, it was very important, or it was a key conflict for the environmental history of Chile. And because of that, a lot of the environmental institutions were under review, because I mean, how can this happen? Uh, and also the, the word wetland started to to be more prominent and to, to appear in the in our vocabulary. We didn't talk about wetlands before before this event. So what happened is that okay, in 2004 the you have the disaster, the social movement started, and then there are a lot of accusations, legal issues. And in 2013, there was a historical trial that says that Araujo is guilty and they have to pay an important uh, compensation of money. And what they were going to do with the money? So they created a, it was a consultancy organism uh, composed by citizens and scientists. The Consejo Consultivo Social, Social Scientists Consulting Committee. And they decided that the money would go to five measures, compensatory measures, a, a long-term monitoring and a diagnosis of the wetland, a community project, and a research center, which is the, the wetland center that I'm currently working on. And another one that is a wetland, it was like a, a wet, an artificial wetland outside the, the plant to see how it, how it was doing like the, the wastewater that I think is not working very well, <laughs> of course, because <laughs> two years ago we started uh, losing the soils again. So this is how the, the center looks like. Uh, and I would like to show you a little video. Unfortunately, unfortunately the video is in Spanish, but I would like to show you a first minute, so you can see, because there are aerial, aerial videos of Valdivia, and you can see how it looks like <laughs> this place. Oh, where is the... Can you see the podium? Centro de Humedales,
So then you can look at it. Uh, it doesn't have any captions, but you can look at it later, the whole video. But as you could see, we do a bit we do so conservation research, uh, education, and also conservation practice. So the people that we work there, we really like to do both things, conservation research and practice. Oh. And that has been a challenge because in Chile, it's not common to have a, a boundary organization. Like in US, they are more common. So everyone is pushing us to, to decide. No, you can be just a research center or an NGO, but you can do both. <laughs> so we have been fighting and, and the people that we work there, we are like very committed because we like to do both. A little bit of research, a little bit of practice. And it's fun and it's interesting, but it's it's been challenging to identify them ourselves as other organizations. We want to make that. <laughs> Top right um, Yeah, so there are many projects I would like to tell you about, but you can look in the website and and if you have the opportunity to go to Chile, please visit us. It's a very nice place. This house was abandoned, completely abandoned. In the video you can see later that they show how they renovate the house and everything. And it's a very special place. It it has ten hectares. So we have like a park too and a bike lane. It's very beautiful. And well, wetlands, you know, are fundamental for for life on Earth. Uh, here you can see why, how the wetlands are really important for all the sustainable development goals. Uh, you know, clean water, of course, and sustainable cities, climate change. And in cities, of course, they increase the sea as a change. They contribute to manage urban runoff. Uh, they provide sustainable water management and flood control, among many, many other benefits. And that's why uh, the citizens, not only from Valdivia, I think the movement started in Valdivia, but then in other cities of the country, uh, the citizens started to push for, for a law and a legal recognition of the services. Because they are, even though they are super important and beneficial for us, they are severely degrade, degraded um, and they didn't have legal recognition until this law passed in, tw in January 2020. So the origin of the law is very like unique because citizens and social le community leaders, they push for this. And still now that it's under implementation, the role of the, the citizens and social organizations is really important because the housing companies, the, all yeah. the, the organizations that want to, to build on top of the wellness or to pollute, whatever, they go to the, to the tribunales the, to demand and to kind of retract the law. So, the court system, yes, our lawsuits. So all the citizens have to be like all the time, like checking what's going on. Yeah, it's really. And one thing that we did at the wellness center was the to develop the sustainability criteria for for this law. Uh, so in March 2020, we started this project, and it was very interesting because. They asked the Minister of Environment, asked for an architect, expert on in urban planning, a lawyer, an urban ecologist, and an expert in facilitation. <laughs> so in that case was key, all the things that I learned in, in Joe's class and in CCD. So all the opportunities I had to practice the skills. Um, so we did this project and we had to develop this sustainability criteria for urban, urban wetlands, um, which which is in the guidelines of the, for the implementation of the law. It's like you have the law that is only two pages, but then you need the guidelines that tell you how to implement. So we, at the beginning, we didn't understand what they wanted for us to do. Like, what is the criteria? What do they want from us? And, uh, 
the lawyer was key there and she said, you know, when there is a lawsuit or something, the lawyers need to know, need a criteria, like a rule or a norm uh, to decide if this goes against the white man or not. So we put together an interdisciplinary team. It was more than the people that the Minister of Environment asked for us. So we had a, a expert in conservation, Ignacio, he's the director of the White House Center, and he did his PhD here at UF in Soil and Water Department. So that's very uh, useful too, because we have we have created like a, a mini GCD <laughs> in the home. It's like our safe space there. <laughs> Uh, if it's expert in environmental education and in, in wetlands, she knows a lot about wetlands, all the algae, animals, she's like an encyclopedia of wetlands. Uh, a urban ecologist and the lawyer, Daniela, the lawyer, Flavio was the architect, it was very fun to work <laughs> with an architect, and Claudia, who was the expert in, in water movements and all that stuff. So we all work together. Uh, let me Hide. No. Yeah. So we all were looking for from different disciplines and expertises, we're looking to develop the sustainability criteria together. And this is the process we follow. It was mandate, mandated by the Minister of Environment. Uh, but we first it was a huge work in three months. And the pandemic started at the same time, so it was very, very challenging. And we had to, uh, well, first understand all the threats that urban wetlands face along the country, review all the legal instruments nationally and internationally, and develop a set of criteria. Just me, the, the team, decide okay, this would be like the criteria, and then we run workshops all over the country. I was supposed to travel from Arista to Punta <laughs> But I had to do everything by Zoom, as you might imagine. <laughs> and we divided the country in six big zones. So we had a, a total of 13 workshops at the end. And we validated the our proposal with, with NGOs, the public services, the some private companies. And it was very interesting to see how it changed a lot. Like our initial proposal mm -hmm. with all the feedback that the participants. So there you have a picture, boring picture. One more of Zoom meetings. <laughs> and this is all the participants in the six uh, in the six areas. The number five, which is the more mm, uh, Cordita, <laughs> the biggest one, is the, the where the Valdivians are, like the Los Rios region, like Los Lagos, where there are a lot of wetlands and social movements. And we work with yeah, the academics, you know, experts, uh, public services, social organizations, and some private companies. So this is a huge work, I'm not gonna tell you all about it, but we came up with four groups of criteria that then the Minister of Environment uh, changed it a little bit, but uh, we had four criteria. One, to protect the ecological characteristics of these ecosystems and their functioning. Another about the hydrological, the hydrological system. Uh, some criteria for the rational use of these wetlands. And these ones that were more human dimensions focused about governance, education, citizen science, and sustainable management. The report is huge. I don't remember how many pages it has, but you can download it here in the web, web this website of the guest Humanales Costeros. It's kind of a, a book <laughs> and it's really interesting. And all of that, like all the proposal of minimum criteria for sustainability is here in the in the reglament, in the guidelines to implement the law. So this doesn't have an impact factor. <laughs> but in real life it has. <laughs> yeah, and now coming back to transformation, 
and my postdoc research. So what are the research questions? So as you may imagine, we had this huge event in 2004 in Bolivia, and it made me think about pre-transformation. And all that happened later, kind of the institutionalization of this transformation, right? Like the wetland center, this community project, all this governance. Uh, and I started thinking, okay, but there are other wetlands in Bolivia, and they also have political action and things are going on. So I was wondering what, what form of collective action uh, is happening in this wetland and what transformation phases they are currently in. Also, what are the repertoire of uh, social practices and responses in different wetlands in Valdivia? And finally, to what extent participatory and experimental approaches like UT Labs could have an impact and strengthen collective action for transformation. So I have three objectives related to those questions. And I've been doing semi-structured interviews, press review, field observation, participant observation in organized actions. This, this has been by far the most fun <laughs> because people eat and they socialize. It's really interesting. And the last one that is to this year, I have to design and implement a lab in one of the cases and evaluate it. And John will help me. <laughs> to do that. So this is the city. You can see here the city limits in dark blue, the rivers, and those are the five wetlands that are protected under the law. Um, this is the Teja Island, which is overlap a little bit with the Rio Cruces, which is bigger. Del Bosque, Angachilla, Catrico, and Crab in pink. And I've, I've been doing timelines with different well, uh, relevant events to collective action. Here you can see in, in orange the timeline for Rio Cruces. I just selected the main events because it's, I could be forever doing this. <laughs> and it keeps going on and on. So at some point I have to stop and, and say, okay, this is going to be a timeline. And I just wanted to see how it looks like when you look at all of them. In white, you have all the, at the public policy level or national level, what is going on, the first with the strategy, then the inventory of wetlands, then the first ordinance in Valdivia, uh, then the national protection, plan of protection for wetlands, and then the law. But in other wetlands, as you can see in Gachilla, there are also things going on, uh, different type of things related to a conflict they have with a bridge they want to build there. In the Kramer, which is the tiny one in pink, there is a, a, also a social movement, they do cleanups. A, all these wetlands have been declared under the urban wetlands law. A, in Catrico also there is a strong social movement. This is a vulnerable community, so they have recovered all this area because they don't have any green spaces to, to do recreation and stuff like that. So they have cleaned up that space and recovered. And also in El Bosque, uh, which this was a, another interesting case because it was is where we live actually. They develop all that area, but it was a um, it was from the university. And they sell this land to the this company, the housing company. But they say, okay, we're going to sell you the land, but you have to protect this piece of forest, which is like, uh, it's amazing because you go there, you're in the middle of the city, but you can find trees, like very old trees. It's like being in a Valdivian forest, and you have the forest and the well in the middle of the city. And that was the commitment to protect this, this part. And they created an ecological committee composed by neighbors. And they do, they focus a lot in environmental education. And they have more infrastructure and things like that. And when you look at all of them, at the beginning, I thought that the rest of the wetlands fall, would follow, or, or everything started with the Rio Cruces. 
But for example, in the case of Enbosque, it started earlier or kind of at the same time. And also when you talk with people, for example, in Angachilla, they say, I hate when they say that all oh, started with the Rio process and Swans, because our fight is different and it has nothing to do with, with the Rio process. So it's been interesting to see like all together how it unfolds. And with the participant observation, we've been participating in different activities and we have seen that there are kind of five big groups of civic ecological practices. On one hand, you have all the practices that are direct, directly impacted by biodiversity, like cleaning up, uh, planting trees, uh, things that you do in the wetland. Then there are practices related to governance and conflict management meetings, things to solve problems. Uh, also practices related to create awareness, festivals, photograph, uh, guide, I mean, paseos where you go walk and take pictures just to invite other neighbors, invite them to see the wetlands or biking, for example, things like that. Uh, other practices that are related to self-organization and management, meetings and stuff like that. And practices related to environmental education, capacity building. And here you can see an illustration. This is from a uh, south view from the city, aerial. And you can see some of the main characteristic practices of the different wetlands. Here, here is in El Bosque, for example. They focus a lot in environmental education and kids. It rains a lot, that's why they have umbrellas. <laughs> the Vikings, the carnivals in Catrico, uh, the people in the water in Angachilla. There are women in Angachilla that do, do quilts, and it's very, very nice. And this is one of the Sundays in Angachilla. They meet every Sunday in three different parts of the web. And in this part, they, they get there like every Sunday since 15 years ago. And they get into the water. If it's, it's winter, they clean up the forest that is, surrounds this area. But in summer, they get into the water and they try to get, get rid of the invasive species. But also, they find a lot of garbage and trash inside the water. Like every, every time they go, they find new stuff. And this is an old washing machine. So it's amazing. And one of the interviewees uh, said to me that I found really interesting that they go there to heal the system or the wetland, but actually they are healing themselves. So it was very nice. So he said the word healing appeared to us when we work on Sundays in Angachilla wetland. We converse a lot, we felt, we reflected, we theorize. We chase high water, collecting plants, we converse a lot and arrive at this idea of healing. Healing has to do with us realizing that we were sick, that the wetland was sick, and that what we are, were doing had a healing effect. Greater than, greater than restoration, greater than recuperation, than the defense, which are the classic words used in the citizen movement or in scientific and ecological action. The word healing made a lot of sense to us because we felt that these were actions that healed. But in the healing, we healed. And there was a very strong point. So I really like that quote because it illustrates the deep connection they have between them when they go there to do the cleanups and with the, with the wedding. And these are just some pictures. I think I should be stopping. Uh, this is in a, in the same wetland. This is Simona there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went there one one Sunday that Felipe didn't want to <laughs> stay with her at home. So I took care. <laughs> I took care. Oh, I need to go to the field, sorry. And we were cleaning this area because the leader there said that 
she was worried because there was a lot of invasive plants and the police couldn't see inside and there were some cars at night, in bad stuff, drinking, whatever. And if something happened there, then they say, oh, it's the community fight, you have there a lot of robbers and bad people. So that's why she wanted us to clean to clean that area. And, and that's what meaning of that practice. And yeah, what I'm trying to to analyze now is all the meanings, the abilities, and also the materials that goes into these practices. I did a few bit. <laughs> so in this picture, this this guy is going to the water to check a American mink trap. <laughs> I showed this yesterday in Joe's class, and we were wondering what the bison wear because we call bison, but it's not the bison the in that you know in US. It's an American mink. So he was going to check the the traps and they are using kayaks, you know, and different materials to, to do their work. And some of them go into the water and the rest of us uh, go stay there and get all the, the branches and things like that and we move it to other places with, with the carretillo. And after that, it's really fun because there is a lady that goes there and she cooks sopaipillas, which is like a bread, a fried bread, that's the best sopaipillas <laughs> in Valdivia. Okay, so it's really nice at the end, like everyone sharing food and talking. So the, the pictures I show you is in this area. So this is the whole wetland. Well, it's bigger, right? It goes down there, the river, down the Chilla River. But this is the wetland. Actually, my house, our house is here. This is the Bosque neighborhood. And the pictures are from here. And in this other village, they also get together every Sunday. And sometimes they scream at each other. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and in this village too, sometimes. And they want to build, a, the government has planned to build a bridge here to connect this, you know, this road with this one. So this is what the conflict is, is all about now because the bridge would go just on top of all the work they have done. You know, the stairs, the signs, the forest. So yeah, that's what uh, I'm thinking that the Zilab would focus in this, in this wetland in particular. And conclusions, well, more than conclusion thoughts, I think that the, uh, this, research, this research has helped to understand self-organization processes, community stewardship of these green commons in the cities, uh, the social practice theory that at the beginning to me was hard to understand. I start feeling like it, uh, it's been helpful to see these practices. And also that the DCD train, training has been key to develop uh, all this research and practices, yeah, conservation practice as well. So thanks. <laughs>